Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to see you as we are continuing and beginning to close now the book of Hebrews. Uh, we are going to start chapter 13 today, so if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn with me over there, we're going to look at the first six verses of chapter 13 this morning. I've entitled the lesson, Don't Forget Your Schooling. This is going to be a three-part teaching series from this particular chapter. And the one we're going to look at today is dealing with the first six verses, which is practical obligations for Christians. If you've ever graduated from anything, really high school is the first time you really notice this, I think, but if you go on to college and graduate from there, uh, what happens is everyone gets all dressed up and this is the day that uh, you walk across the stage and you get your diploma and you move to the next chapter of your life. Most often when you go to this graduation ceremony, someone somewhere will uh, make an allusion to when, when you first started. You guys remember back when we were freshmen and we came into this building and it seemed to be so big and, and it seemed like all of these men and women were walking around called students because after all, we were just kids. And then we, we go through the first year and then we develop a little more confidence and then we go through the sophomore and junior year and by the time we're seniors, we can't wait just to, just to bust out of that high school and move on to something else. And somewhere along the way, someone's going to stand up and give a speech. Maybe it'll be the valedictorian, or perhaps the principal or the guest speaker who will say, you know, we spent four years going through this institution learning all of this facts and data. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you will have a chance to leave this institution and begin to apply it in life. It's always almost kind of a sad occasion. There's certainly great happiness associated with it. I mean, after all, at the end, people normally throw up that little triangular thing they're wearing that we call a hat up in the air. But there's also an air of sadness with it as well. Why? Because we know that we can never go back. And such is the case with what the writer is telling us today. We have spent all of this time dealing with all of these tremendous doctrines, some of the greatest that we find in Scripture in reference to the person and the work of Christ. And now in chapter 13, he goes back to get very, very personal. Because he realizes we're about to leave, where that is, we're about to depart the book of Hebrews. And so what he's going to do for us is offer for us several commands to help us apply what he has taught us in reference to who Christ is and what Christ has done. So this entire segment, that is the first part of the, the chapter here in 13, uh, the first 19 verses is really dealing with don't forget your schooling. You're going to leave here, you're going to go out, you're going to be in the world, but don't forget your schooling. Don't forget what we covered. Don't forget what we taught. So in, in verses 1 through 6, he's going to give us some practical obligations for the Christian. And then in, in verses 7 through 14, he's going to give us pastoral obligations. That is, how we are to respond to those that God puts in leadership over us. And then in verses 15 through 19, he deals with personal obligations that the believer has before the Lord and before his church. So practical obligations, verse 1 through 6, pastoral obligations, 7 through 14, and personal obligations, verses 15 through 19. So let's begin by looking at the first six verses here. He's dealing with practical obligations of how to apply everything that he's just taught us. And he begins with our treatment concerning other people, that is, concerning treatment of men. By men, I'm referring to men and women, generally generic men. And he's going to be dealing specifically with two kinds or types of groups. The first are neighbors. Neighbors. And here he's going to be addressing those that are both Christians and those that are non-Christians that fall under the heading of neighbors. Look at what he says 
verses 1 through 3. Let love of the brethren continue. Now the word let there comes from the Greek word meno, which means to remain or to abide. And here he's using this as a command. It's a present tense verb in the active voice, and it's an imperative, meaning you do it. You do it. Let love of the brethren continue. Now, uh, most of the time when we see the word love, if uh, you'll have the idea or notion that, oh, it's in the Bible and it's in the New Testament. It's got to be agape, right? No, not here. The word is Philadelphia. Philadelphia comes from two Greek words, phileo, which is love, adelphos, which is the word for brother. So you combine those two, you have the word Philadelphia, which is brotherly love, which is why the city of brotherly love is called in the United States Philadelphia. Philadelphia. That's right. He says, let love for the brethren continue. But then he also adds, he says, do not neglect to show hospitality. Now, the word hospitality there, phileozina, which is love for other people. Love for other people. Not Christians, but those who are non-believers, strangers, if you will. We've heard the phrase most recently over the past four or five years here, uh, the word xenophobe, right? Xenophobe is what? It means to be, be afraid of differing people groups, right? Xeno is the word for people. So he's, he says here, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, people outside of the faith. And he says, for, reason, by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now what's he making a reference to here? Is he talking about, well, I, I met a fellow at the gas station and, uh, you know, he asked me for a dollar and I figured I would kind of help him out. I shared the gospel with him. And, and, but something was weird about that guy. <laughs> he had a halo glowing around his head. And when he walked, feathers fell out of the back of his shirt. No, no. Angels are spirit beings, right? They can appear as men. And we know that in the Old Testament, on at least four occasions, we have men who were showing hospitality to angels. We have Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. We have Lot in Genesis chapter 19. Remember the two angels that came in and then destroyed the city when they sent Lot and his family out. Uh, you have uh, Gideon in Judges chapter 6 with the captain of the Lord of hosts. And then you have Manoah in Judges 13. Remember, Manoah was the father of Samson. So all of these people showed hospitality to angels. Now, now why is he making a big deal out of this? This is really something that you have to understand from the culture. We don't have this issue today. But if you were to go to an inn, a hotel, here in this country, unless it's, you're in a real shady part of town where they charge by the hour or what have you, uh, then <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't want to go and take your family and stay in that kind of inn. Uh, we have five-star hotels here, right? Well, back in the ancient times when Christians were going about sharing the gospel and they would come into a different city. You may have a husband and wife team coming in that showing hospitality was very, a very high priority in the ancient uh, Near Eastern culture. Uh, one of the things that I, that I come to realize today is uh, this past uh, couple of months ago, we spent almost uh, two, three weeks in Cambodia. Right? We were able to travel around there. And one of the things that, that I absolutely love about the Cambodian people, which is very similar to what, the way it was during the time of Jesus in the first century there, is the fact that as a people group, their culture is very, very aware of what it's like and the demand to be hospitable. To be hospitable. You say, well, what do you mean to be hospitable? Well, by hospitable, it means that when you show up, they do everything. 
They take care of everything. They take care of all of your needs. Very, very hospitable. Take care of, are you hungry? Let me get you something to eat. Uh, you know, you, you, I mean, you name it. It was almost, you know, th th they kinded, showed kindness to the, the point where it was almost like, wow, you know, tur turn it down some. Why? B because that's their culture. Now, when you were, a, say, a Christian missionary in the first century and you're traveling from city to city and you find out that there's brothers and sisters there who have a little church in their home, then obviously you would not want to stay at one of the local inns because that was a place a lot of times where there were people of low character staying there or prostitution was there. Uh, one commentator st stated that, you know, one of the worst professions that a person could have was an innkeeper. Why? Uh, because they would be equated to our modern times with someone like a pimp. Um, and so Christians did not want to go stay in that area or, or stay in those kinds of places. And so the writer here is exhorting and encouraging his Christian audience that, look, look, when you have travelers come through, show them hospitality. If they're brothers and sisters in Christ, it's your duty. If they're unbelievers and you demonstrate the love of Christ to them through and which how you act with them, then that what a powerful witness of the Lord's love for them being seen through your acts of kindness in dealing with strangers. And then he goes on to say, plus, you never know, it could be God's way of testing you by sending one of his messengers down to see how are you going to handle this particular situation. So, you're to demonstrate love for your neighbors. Now, some of you might be saying, okay, well, well how are these people my neighbors? How is a stranger my neighbor? That's a good question. Jesus said it this way when over in the Gospel of Luke, a young lawyer stood up to test him. And the question was given, what are the greatest commandments? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And seeking to justify himself, he asked the Lord, and who is my neighbor because he wants to be technical Jesus replied and said to him a man was going down the from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped and beat him and went away leaving him half dead and by chance a priest was going down on the road and when they saw him he passed by on the other side likewise a Levite also when he came to the place and saw him passed by on the other side but a Samaritan who was on a journey came up on him and when he saw him he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds pouring oil and wine on them and he put them on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him on the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return I will repay you and then he asked the question, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said, go home and do the same, or go and do the same. So here Jesus answers the question, who was my neighbor? But he doesn't answer the question by defining it's the guy who lives next door or five houses down or what have you. His answer is this, you're asking the question, who is my neighbor? And my answer to you is, to whom can you be neighborly? You see the difference. A neighbor then is anyone who comes within your sphere of influence. Your neighbor is anyone who comes within your sphere of influence which you have the capacity to minister to and help. That's why the writer there in Hebrews addresses both Christians and non-Christians who come within the influence of the church and the individuals that make up the church. I mean, after all, that's how the world will know that we are truly believers in God by means of what we proclaim, but also what we do. Jesus said in John 13, I give a new commandment to you, 
to love one another just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Everyone will know by this that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the very first thing that the writer tells us in his going away speech as we're leaving the book of Hebrews is, don't forget to love your neighbors. And also, don't forget to love the neglected. And we see that in verse 3. He says, remember prisoners, or remember the prisoners, as though in prison with them. And those who were ill-treated, since you yourselves are also are in the body. Now, again, we're not being cast into prison for our faith in this country right now. That's not to say that that may not be a part of our future. It very well could be. And when and if that time comes, we need to be mindful and still be able to minister to those who are in prison as well. And he's not talking about a general prison ministry here. I remember MacArthur uh, made the comment that he went into a prison and a guy said, well, you know, I'm a Christian and, uh, you know, and I'm here in prison. And MacArthur said, oh, so how are you in prison for your faith? And he said, well, I, I'm not in prison for my faith. I committed a robbery and, you know, got caught. And I mean, he's like, look, when you're in here, don't tell people you're a Christian. Don't tell people you're a Christian because you're in here for robbing someone or what have you. No, you're, he, the context here is visiting those who, because of their faith, are suffering persecution. Pentecost notes, he says, The third exhortation encouraged believers to identify with those who were actually imprisoned for their faith or who are suffering because they live in the midst of those who are hostile to Christ. These believers would be in desperate need of another's help. Those who were not persecuted should, I, should identify themselves with those who are because they are part of the same body. This is also an exhortation the Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 12, where he says, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And also in 2 Timothy chapter 1, what we might call Paul's last will and testament, notice his heart, and here he really pours his heart out in this letter, more so than all of his other epistles. And this is what he said in reference to the circumstances when he was imprisoned. This time in Rome, this time he was not going to escape, this time he would ultimately be beheaded. And while he is awaiting that day, he writes, to the Timothy at the church in Ephesus. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well what service he rendered at Ephesus. So here was a man who was ministering to Paul, trying to seek him out. I mean, he wasn't just calling the jail, uh, you know, in the morning time saying, hey, do you got a Paul in there? You know, he was actively going to the various jails uh, within Rome and seeking out Paul the apostle so that he could minister to his needs. So practical obligations that we are commanded to fulfill is that concerning men who are our neighbors and the neglected. And then secondly, he switches gears and begins to talk about marriage. Practical obligations for the Christian concerning marriage. And what he says is that marriage is to be held in high regard and to remain sexually pure. Look at verse 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So what he's saying is, is that the original purpose that God, for why he gave marriage, has never changed. I realize our culture now is inundated with all kinds of sexual immorality uh, that appeals to the world and even appeals to the church today in terms of its sexual ethics. 
And I know we're going to be in this kind of a, a careful area here where we're talking about things like sex. Most of the time, you know, 20, 30 years ago in the church, you would have never said that three-letter word. But we need to understand that sex is something that was designed by God. It was given to us by God. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And most of you are here because of it. <laughs> now, notice this principle. The biblical concept of marriage and family. And it's basically this. The biblical idea of family is one man and one woman united by marriage to become one flesh. And this is for a lifetime. And to produce children whom they raise to adulthood. Ideally then, a Christian family would be a believing man and a believing woman united by marriage and raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And a good Christian family would be one that possesses all of the qualities necessary to be a Christian and to be a family. You say, well, where do we get, begin with that? Well, we go back to the very beginning, the book of Genesis. God gave the mandate for marriage in Genesis chapter 1, along with man's responsibilities. In verse 27, Moses, who writes the book of Genesis, says, So God created human beings in His own image, and in the image of God He created them. Male and female He created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And so the, command, the, the mandate or the command for the man and the woman in reference to specifically their marital sexual union is be fruitful and multiply. This is something that Jesus reaffirmed in the New Testament. So this has always been the mandate from the very beginning. In Matthew 19, the religious leaders of the day, uh, separated by two schools of thought regarding marriage and divorce, uh, wanted to come to Jesus and kind of get his opinion on what he thought in reference to marriage and divorce. And Jesus' response was in verse 4 of chapter 19, Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, uh, the rec They record that from the beginning God made them male and female, God, and he said to them, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two were united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And then what about divorce? Which is exactly the issue that Jesus is having to deal with. Well, Jesus responded, because of the hardness of your heart, it wasn't God's intent for divorce to take place, but because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, now here's a rule, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So here is what we call the exception clause in marriage. I realize today in this country, and particularly in this state, people can get what we call no-fault divorces. That's not biblical, that's not ideal, and that's certainly not something uh, that God uh, issues. The only exception to marriage in terms of divorce is sexual immorality. The word there in the Greek is the word pornea, from where we get our English word pornography. And sexual Immorality, or pornea, is a general term which includes adultery, but it also includes sins, sexual sins, and varieties of other kinds of sexual sins, which would also include homosexuality, uh, bigamy, having more than one wife or husband, uh, prostitution, uh, incest, and bestiality. Jesus was saying that divorce that does not result from sexual immorality results in the sin of adultery if there is any remarriage. Ideally then, God's standard based upon this one clause that would allow for a divorce would be this. In other words, if you 
been daydreaming and not been listening and you're wanting the bottom line, here's the bottom line when it comes to divorce. Any sexual relationship or desire to engage in a sexual relationship or a sexual act, whether it be premarital relationships, extramarital relationships, which would be adultery, uh, bestiality, which would be sexual relations with animals, pedophilia, which would be sexual relationships with children, necrophilia, which would be sexual relationships with a dead body, or homosexuality is sin. Jesus in the New Testament affirmed that sexual relationships are only allowed, watch this, within the context of marriage between one man and one woman who were married to each other. That's it. That's it. We don't need to go to a marriage seminar on what is a marriage. This is it right here. It is one man faithfully married to one woman until death do they part. Swindoll says, as Christians in a corrupt world, we may not be able to reverse the destructive ideas and practices that mark us as a society with its doors wide open to promiscuity and perversion. However, we can attend to our own marriages and set an example of purity, sanctity, and faithfulness. That's how we honor the marriage relationship and press on toward maturity by the power of the Holy Ghost. And let me say one more thing before we move on to our final one, and that is this. I realize that in our country, the divorce rate is over 50%. That statistic is reflective of the church as well. So I don't want anyone in here who is divorced now, who is now in a godly marriage, to walk around thinking that somehow they have a spiritual scarlet A attached to their forehead or their chest. Okay? We all have made mistakes. We have all sinned uh, when it comes to that. So if you're now remarried or if you're single based upon uh, a failed marriage in the past, uh, if you have asked forgiveness and repented of that, then that sin is wiped clean. It doesn't mean the consequences of that relationship are over with, or you may be dealing with that with children and so forth uh, from that previous marriage, but it does mean that God has forgiven you of that sin. So be encouraged and press on. And then finally in verses 5 and 6, in terms of the practical obligations for believers, he issues... The third obligation, and that is our treatment with money and resources. And what he's encouraging us to do is to be content with what God has given us in terms of our personal resources. Look at verse 5. Make sure, the writer notes, that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. There he's quoting Deuteronomy 31. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? What he's trying to do is encourage his readers, look, if God has given you these things and you're trusting in Him regardless of what kind of financial circumstances you find yourself in, then you're in a good space. Because the pursuit of money and resources for the sake of what those things may bring you also will bring you a lot of pain. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul said this, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Sometimes on Facebook you'll catch these little posts that say, well, if, you know, making fun of the church, they'll say, if the love of money is the... Uh, if money is the root of all evil, then why do churches want it so much, right? Atheist Republic put that meme out, but they left out the phrase, the love of money. It's not money in and of itself that is the root of evil. It is one's love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered now, what's interesting, this word wandered, it means to cause to have wrong beliefs or to mislead someone by an intentional deception. 
They've wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Which really begs the question, what then causes Christians to be discontent? Why, why have that issued warning in reference to pursuing money or the love of money? Quite frankly, discontentment is a sin issue that all of us can be faced with when we stop trusting in God and His provision and His resources to fulfill our lives. What people do is they start focusing upon themselves, which is really an attack upon God. It's an attack on His character. It's an attack on His Word. And it's an attack on His promises. And that's why the Bible marks this kind of sin as such an offense to God. Contentment, on the other hand, would be the opposite of discontentment here. And consider what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, in the context here, he's talking about unbelievers, eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He recognizes there's a need for stuff, to have stuff. But notice he says, this is how you go about getting it. Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, how you arrange and order your life. And all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day, he says, has enough trouble of its own. So how does a Christian become content? Basically, it's like this. By staying focused on kingdom priorities. Namely, personal holiness, what you do, how you arrange and order your life, and the ministry of love toward other people. If that's your priority, if that's your focus, you'll find a certain level of protection from greediness, from the love of money. MacArthur notes, contentment does not flow from selfish fulfillment. It flows from serving others, from loving others, fellowshipping with others, sharing with others, bearing one another's burdens, caring for one another, ministering to one another. When you know that you're loved and you love, you can be content no matter what the struggle. That's why Paul could say this over in Philippians 4. He says, Now that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. How was he able to do that? By being focused upon God rather than focused upon his circumstances. He says, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of being fulfilled or filled and going hungry, both having an abundance and suffering need. How does he do that? Simply this. And for those of you who are chart people, and I'm kind of like, I like schematics. Give me a chart. Our relationship with God as we focus upon the intake of His Word and the application of it in life, when that becomes your overarching priority, then what you will find is that you will naturally, as a byproduct of that, have peace and contentment in reference to your resources, namely money, and your relationships, that, was, that which falls within your sphere of influence, your employment, and your security. Why? Because God says you focus on the God word, and He'll take care of the horizontal. All of these things will be added to you. A.W. Tozer said it this way. He said, the man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. So what can we take away from this? Three things real quickly. First, start each day with a firm conviction that you will love other people, your neighbors and the neglected. This can most often be demonstrated in simple acts of kindness in doing things that minister to other people. Secondly, start each day with prayer. 
particularly prayer for your spouse, for your children, and other believers. This is something my wife and I uh, recently began to really concentrate upon. Uh, and it's hard to, to wake up and have any adversement when you're praying for each other. You want to make the blues go away? Pray for them. And let them know that you're praying for them because they're right next to you holding your hand. And then third, start each day by thanking God for the resources He has given you, knowing that if we want or need anything, we should ask God to grant it. When Abraham Lincoln was a young man, he and another fellow named Barry owned a small country store. And this store wasn't doing very well. Barry asked Lincoln, he said, How much longer can we keep this up? Lincoln said, Well, it looks as if our business is just about winked out. Then he said, you know, I wouldn't mind so much if I could just go to what I really wanted to do, and that's, I want to study the law. I'd love to be a lawyer. I wish I could just sell everything that we've got and pay all of our bills and have just enough left over so that I could go and buy me a Blackstone Law Commentary. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. About that time... A covered wagon was coming down the road, and the man pulled up and said, I'm trying to move out west. Would you be willing to buy a good used barrel for 50 cents? Lincoln pulled out the last 50 cents that he had and said, Sure, I guess I can always use a good barrel. Well, that barrel stood on the porch of that little country store all day long, with Barry kidding Lincoln about the foolish purchase that he made. Finally, Lincoln walked over to the barrel and put his long, lanky arm down into it and felt something hard. He pulled the contents out of the barrel and there stood, he stood petrified. It was Blackstone's commentary on English law. He later wrote, I stood there holding the book and looking up toward the heavens. There came a deep impression on me that God had something for me to do. And he was showing me now that I had to get ready to do it. Why and otherwise would he give me this miracle? You have issues, problems, we all do. We're all looking to have peace and tranquility with God. And if that's really the desire of your heart, the answer is really quite simple. And that is to do exactly what the writer here says the practical obligations for Christians to love other believers, to love people who come within your sphere of influence, your neighbors, to hold up your marriage as sanctified and holy and don't hang too tightly upon the things that God gives us in this life because we can't take it with us. But we can send investments to heaven ahead of us. And you start doing that right now through your thoughts, your words, and your actions. So do it well.